We're going to talk more about this law, what some call the shoot first law, not only in Florida but in other states, in a moment. But I wanted to go to Shelton Marshall before he has to leave. Uh, he is with the Black Law Students Association at Florida A&M. He's joining us from Orlando. Shelton, uh, you were involved in a protest yesterday. Explain what it is you're calling for and describe the protest. Who came? Well, um, we characterize our event yesterday more as a rally for justice. Um, and our demands were to seek for the imminent, uh, the immediate arrest of George Zimmerman for the death of Trayvon Martin. Our purpose um, primarily was to bring awareness to the situation. We felt as though, from the outside looking in, there was no transparency. Um, in addition to that, there was continuous attempts to cover up or hide or be lack disclosure in a lot of the evidence that was out there. And we, as law students, were concerned because we are the advocates of the day today and attorneys of tomorrow. And if this injustice can be done today, what happens when we go out to the legal field and we want to practice and we have clients we want to defend or we're trying to prosecute on behalf of one of our clients and we have these laws that inhibit us from doing so. And one of the major things that we noticed um, on yesterday was that this self-defense claim, um, we're still wondering where does this come from, because self-defense is a defense to a murder. It's not a all and be all that remedies you from being brought up on charges. It's your defense to claim self-defense in the event that you do engage in a murder or activity, but you're still arrested and you're still charged. There was no arrest. There was no charge. And the public outcry has been so overwhelming because of this, because it can be anyone. This isn't just a matter that affects the African-American community. It affects the community at large. And we need to recognize that and join in on the movement, because justice for Trayvon is justice for all. What about the audio clips that we heard, these 911 tapes that are so chilling, and we didn't play the half of them? Um, the voice uh, that the police are saying they are investigating, saying they don't know whether it's the voice of the shooter, Zimmerman, or the voice of um, Trayvon. <sighs> well, I think that's utterly absurd. But when I listened to the tapes no more than twice, um, I couldn't listen to it more than that. It was, like you said, chilling was the exact word that I used when I posted after my immediate response. You hear someone crying. You hear someone out loud crying for help. And my thoughts are that if a man um, that weighs almost 100 pounds more than a child comes to or, how do you say, pursues him with a gun in his pocket, why is he crying out for help? I, I just don't understand that. But that aside, you hear a child's cry for help. You hear a plea for someone's life. Then you hear a gunshot, and then you hear silence. You hear the life exit from the body of a victim. That is what you hear in that tape. You do not hear a grown man pleading for his life, for his safety, because he's trying to protect the neighborhood. Shelton, you're with the Black Law Students Association. You're a law student at Florida A&M, a young African-American man. How has this personally affected you, your friends, folks at the protest yesterday? I would say that um, the, um, the impact of this has taken on a snowball effect. Initially, a lot of people have contacted me, like, is that really happening? Is, are you all like, is that, did that really occur in Florida? And like, can people get away with that? And they thought it was something that was on, like, a reality—I mean, on some type of TV show, rather than being reality. And it is—it's disheartening to say that I live in an area where this can occur. Um, initially, my thoughts were that it's disgusting that the behavior of the Sanford Police Department and the behavior of the community in relation to this case, that they did not see an issue with the behavior of the police department or the state attorney's office in handling the matter. Um, as, a, as an African-American male, I felt as though it was my duty to step up. Um, I have been afforded the privileges of being in a position where I can advocate for those who, do not, who are not able to advocate for themselves. And that is my responsibility um, as an African-American male who is in law school, because if I don't stand for something, who will stand for them? Are your teachers talking about this well? Are you discussing this in your classes? And what is your next step after yesterday's protest? And are you satisfied about the FBI Justice Department stepping in? Um, I would say that there has been a um, chatter amongst campus about the matter. 
Um, we are a very diverse campus, although we attend um, what's considered our HBCU law school. Um, we still have a diverse group of individuals who have diff um, differing opinions on the matter. Um, has it been the f up front foremost um, activity on campus? I would say no, and that's why my organization and other entities in, um, on campus took hold of it to promote it. So it wouldn't go by as just something of another black guy who just got killed, you know? And as far as our next role within this movement, um, right now, we want to serve as a supportive entity to go to the um, local rallies that are already being set. We're here not to distract from the movement, but to push it forward and support the rallies that we have on Thursday with Al Sharpton. There's another um, event on Monday at the um, City Hall, and we have other local um, individuals who are doing candlelight vigils and services in which we want to show, show up and show our presence. Um, after these series of rallies that are going on in the next few weeks, we'll probably reconvene to try to do a more national program to um, bring awareness at local colleges um, and law schools throughout America. Um, as far as satisfaction is concerned, like I stated yesterday, after the meeting with um, the assistant state attorney for Sanford, um, Mr. Pat Whitaker, um, are we satisfied? No, because justice has not been served to Trayvon Martin and his family. Um, am I um, somewhat pleased with the, um, with the uh, national attention that has been brought to it? Yes. I do feel a little bit more comfortable that an outside organization such as the FBI, such as FBI Department of Justice, are um, taking the lead on this matter and doing their independent investigation outside of the um, state attorney's office and FDLE, because there needs to be oversight in this matter. And one of the things that I was told yesterday that kind of kind of put me back a little bit was that they felt as though the Sanford Police Department did a reasonable investigation um, in the matter. However, the state attorney's office will have to supplement that information to get um, to um, formulate proper charges against George Zimmerman. And that showed me that there was some type of lack or inadequacy in what was done in the preliminary matters as it pertains to the death of Trayvon Martin. We see at the protest, and we've been showing images for folks listening on the radio, you can see the images on our website at democracynow.org, students holding up Skittles. Can you explain, Shelton? Well, the, the premise behind that, and um, in addition to the students from the College of Law and my organization, we did have individuals from the local community. And what we're taught in law school, from a theoretical perspective, is that in self-defense, you need force with force. And force with force, in this case, was a pack of Skittles versus a 9 millimeter gun. So in essence, you're telling me in Sanford that a pack of Skittles is a deadly weapon that can warrant you being shot. and it, and it um, <laughs> and you can claim self-defense. In any other situation, that's not true. You have to meet force with force. You had a larger male who was pursuing a young boy, and in addition to that, you had <laughs> an individual with a 9 millimeter gun versus one without a weapon at all, a pack of Skittles. And it just shows you the disparity um, between the two um, between the two concepts of, oh, I'm a grown man, I'm claiming self-defense, versus a young child who says that I'm just trying to walk home. And it doesn't match up. It doesn't make sense. And for them to continuously try to make it sound as if self-defense is the ultimate claim here, it's just ridiculous. I want to thank you for being with us. I know you have to leave, Shelton. Uh, Shelton Marshall is president of the Black Law Students Association at Florida A&M. Um, and we're going to turn to the reverend in one moment, but I want to play now one of the witnesses of Trayvon Martin's shooting, who's speaking out against the Sanford police. In a recent news conference, Mary Kutcher said police have ignored her testimony and rejected the police theory that it was Zimmerman screaming for help. My point was, is that I feel it was not self-defense, because I heard the crying, and if it was Zimmerman that was crying, Zimmerman would have continued crying after the shot went off. The only thing I saw that night, I heard the crying. We were in the kitchen. I heard the crying. It was a little boy. As soon as the gun went off, the crying stopped. Therefore, it tells me it was not Zimmerman crying. That was witness Mary Kutcher. Reverend Glenn Dames is also with us from Orlando. He's pastor of St. James AME Church in Titusville. He's also president of the North Brevard Ministerial Alliance and former president of the North Brevard NAACP. 
Can you talk about what Mary Kutcher is saying and also your response so far to where this case has gone? From the killing of Trevon Martin, February 26, we're talking about weeks ago, to the FBI, the Justice Department, saying they're stepping in to investigate yesterday, Reverend. Glad to be here on Democracy Now! <clears throat> Amy, I think it's clear, uh, uh, just as Mary stated, that this is absurd. How can you say that it was Mr. Zimmerman crying for help? When Mr. Zimmerman, when Mr. Zimmerman was the one holding the weapon the whole time, uh, he was also 80 pounds heavier than Trayvon. That's absolutely ridiculous, and it's sad. It's a sad day when Sanford police uh, uh, dismiss a credible witness um, in this particular case um, as 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 being non-credible uh, and not taking seriously her claim. Uh, that tells me that this has become a botched investigation, sadly, by the Sanford Police Department. And as I speak to law enforcement individuals who are friends uh, uh, across the state, uh, they tell me privately that this clearly uh, lacks uh, sufficient merit in terms of the Sanford Police investigation. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's sad because Trayvon uh, uh, is now dead. But I think uh, what we're doing now, Amy, is we're making sure uh, that we, uh, in essence, uh, bring his voice back uh, from the grave. And so even from the grave now, we have become Trayvon Martin's voice uh, across the state, across the nation, uh, even internationally. Uh, people uh, uh, as far as Japan are tweeting and Facebooking uh, about uh, uh, the tragedy of this particular crime. Um, and so uh, we're holding rallies. Um, of course, uh, we had a major rally in uh, last Thursday in Sanford, uh, and again uh, on Sunday in Titusville, where we drew uh, uh, close to a thousand people uh, who demanded Mr. Wolfinger uh, bring Trayvon's killer murderer to justice. Because make no mistake about it, Mr. Zimmerman is a murderer. Reverend Glenn Dames, can you talk about Sanford? Give us a history of the community. Uh, uh, Sanford is a, uh, a town in central Florida uh, that, believe it or not, has a history of, of doing some things as such um, uh, questionable investigative practices. Uh, and now uh, they have met their match because the community and the nation uh, uh, has declared that we will not stand for this anymore. Uh, this is modern-day lynching. Uh, uh, and we have decided that we will not accept uh, what Langston Hughes called strange fruit hanging from the trees, uh, which was, of course, African Americans who were hung in that day and time from trees publicly uh, uh, for great outcry. And so now uh, we're making sure uh, that this does not happen in 2012. And so Sanford is a place that is now gaining national attention uh, uh, for a botched investigation. Uh, it's sad that uh, uh, just the just the mere fact, Amy, that Trayvon's parents had to file a missing persons report on their son who was sitting in the morgue when Sanford police had the phone in their custody. That tells me that that's insensitive uh, uh, and callous. How do you have a child? You have to know this is somebody's child. You have the phone with you. You have experts. Uh, 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 you could have traced the phone. Uh, you could have somehow found uh, uh, Trayvon's parents um, uh, uh, to, to notify them, at least notify them, of their son's death. This is absolutely tragic that they could not be uh, uh, the first persons uh, uh, on the scene. His father lived in that particular neighborhood. Why was there not a canvas of every door? Every door should have been knocked on to say, hey, we have a, a young man who's been fatally injured. Um, uh, can you please help us? They didn't knock on any doors. They didn't look for witnesses. Um, and now you have a family that's hurt, devastated, and disappointment, disappointed in the Sanford Police Department. That's absolutely ludicrous. Unless, Reverend Dames, they thought that the boy was a stranger, they, that they assumed, the police assumed that he did not come from the gated community. How sad it is. I wonder why. It, could that be because of the pigmentation of his skin? 
um, how dare he uh, uh, be a resident or have family uh, in that gated community? How dare he? Because uh, the color of his skin, clearly, um, he now uh, is not a resident. Um, why was that not a first thought? Why did they not assume that he couldn't be there? Uh, that's a sad day, a sad commentary, uh, when you have a police department who would assume a young 17-year-old black boy um, a stranger. But well, we're here to say Trayvon is not a stranger. He's our son. He's our brother. He's our cousin. He's our family. And you know what? We believe in family, especially in this nation, uh, because uh, 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 we are all brothers and sisters. And so people of all hues uh, uh, have come together yes. to say that Trayvon, regardless of his color, is our brother, our nephew, our cousin. He is our family. And you know what? We're speaking up for our family member, Trayvon Martin. Uh, I wanted to bring attorney Jasmine Rand back into this, who works with the firm that's representing Trayvon's family. Can you talk about the state attorney and what he said yesterday, Jasmine? Yeah, I think the most astounding part of the meeting with the state attorney to me yesterday, when we uh, initially sat down to talk to him, and we asked him whether or not there was going to be an arrest made. He said that he was continuing the investigation of the Sanford Police Department to see if there was any evidence, enough evidence to prove a claim of self-defense. And when asked whether or not it was his job to prove self-defense or if that was the job of the defense attorney, he told us, well, no, that's not really my job. My job is to prosecute. And it wasn't until later in the conversation when I asked him if he planned on pressing any charges and if there were to be charges pressed, what those charges would be, he responded to me, manslaughter. You know, the fact that he did not begin the conversation by saying, I'm continuing the investigation to see whether or not there's a claim for manslaughter. He began the conversation by saying, I I'm trying to prove whether or not there's a claim for self-defense. His choice of words, I believe, are indicative of his mindset and indicative of what we've already seen from the Sanford Police Department, that they are investigating this case with the lens of trying to prove self-defense instead of investigating this case and uh, investigating the case in a fair and partial manner to see whether or not there is a, the possibility of a murder or a manslaughter charge. So that was alarming to me. The other thing, uh, the other aspect of our conversation that was alarming to me was when asked about race. Uh, you know, the state attorney just brazenly shook his head and wouldn't even address the issue. He said, we're not talking about that. But what we heard was George Zimmerman talking about race. You know, we heard him say twice that Trayvon was black. Um, you know, we heard him use expletives. We heard him say these blanks always get away with it. You know, some people have said that they heard him use the term coon on um, the audio tape, which is a very obvious racial slur you know, against African-Americans. And we also heard the neighbors come forward and say that, yeah, in this, you know, particular neighborhood, we look for young black males to be committing criminal activity. And that's exactly what George Zimmerman did that night. He found a young black male that he did not recognize, assumed that he did not belong there, and he targeted him and he sought him out. So to say that, you know, we're not going to discuss race in this manner in such uh, a brazen term, state attorney, that is your job you're prosecuting, and one of your jobs is to look and see if race did play into this, if race was a factor. So, you know, I was disappointed and disheartened by my conversation with the state attorney, and my fear is that we're going to see more, behave, more of the same from the state attorney that we've seen from the Sanford Police Department. I want to thank you very much, Jasmine Rand, for joining us, head of the Civil Rights Division at Parks and Crump Law Firm. We're going to break. Uh, Reverend, I'd like to ask you to stay on with us. Uh, we are also going to go to Washington, D.C., um, as we leave Tallahassee, to talk with uh, Carolyn Brewer, who's director of communications at the Grady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence, to talk about the law in Florida that the police have invoked to say that the shooter, George Zimmerman, should not even be arrested. Um, this is Democracy Now!, a special on the death of Trayvon Martin. Stay with us.